our knowledge of the moon is growing with the moon challenge. And not surprisingly, so is the moon. We had on day 10 a waxing gibbous moon with about 70% of its face illuminated. To recall where the moon may be in its orbit around the earth during this cycle, we can go back to this diagram and we were at this position at about 90 degrees from the direction of the sun on the first quarter. We are now in between this position and the full moon position where the moon is going to move this way and we are going to have phases of the moon which will increase in their illumination. If we change the diagram slightly, uh, I could in fact add the phases of the moon as seen by us from the earth. The inside circle here that you see is the actual orbit of the moon in which it will always have half of its surface eliminated by the sun's rays. Which part of this surface will be seen will depend on where the moon is on its orbit around the earth. What you see in the outer circle are just images of how the moon would look like to us during the time when the moon, let's say, is at the first quarter position. And this is what you would see, a half lit moon. The waxing gibbous position comes here, somewhere in between the first quarter and the full moon. The moon seems to be fattening up. So these are the two types of phases other than just having a new moon, a full moon or a half moon. Crescent itself is a word these days, although it comes from the root growing. So anything which is shaped like a less than half moon is also nowadays called a crescent. The word gibbous means bulging. As you can see, after the half moon, the part of the moon which is lit up seems to be slightly bulging or convex in shape. So this is called gibbous. In this challenge, you'll get to see all sorts of phases of the moon. There'll be various combinations of light and dark seen on the face of the moon. We, of course, will have the new moon, the full moon, which are very easy to recognize. We will have half moons in which once the apparent left side of the moon will be illuminated and once when the apparent right side will be illuminated. Then we'll have the gibbous phases where the moon will be slightly bulgy. It could be bulgy from this side or it could be bulgy from this side. In fact, the portion of the dark area would also change. This would also mean we would see different types of crescent as well. So we will see crescents which are thicker or thinner and we'll also have some days where it's almost half. Well, if you have gone through the challenge and seen the moon every day, you would never forget how the moon's phases change from new moon, full moon, back to new moon. Why this is important is because there are so many errors in the depiction of moon in our society. We have kind of stopped looking at the moon and therefore we just imagine it to be an object which will be there in the sky and we don't really have to look at it or know anything about it. Well, in modern times, everything seems to have been observed and recorded and we just go by the records. But I'll tell you some errors that I've found in popular literature and art where the moon has been quite incorrectly depicted and nobody ever raised a voice about it. The phases of the moon that are shown in this diagram, which seem so very apparent to you because you're taking up this challenge, may not be so apparent to others who don't hesitate to draw them something like this. Can you see the error in this? The crescent moon can never be like this or like this. And most funnily, the gibbous moon is not at all gibbous. It is still a thick crescent in this diagram. In another example, I can see that somebody has taken a lot of pains to make this lunar calendar. They have actually jotted down dates on which the moon will be new, half, full and the other half. This must have taken a lot of work 
to draw and doodle in this lovely beautiful looking diary. However, the faces of the moon that has been drawn again are wrong. The gibbous can never look like this. This is just a fat crescent. I even know of educators who have come up with this great idea to use cream biscuits to talk about the phases of the moon. You just open up the top and eat away at the cream to represent the diminishing of the phases. That's a clever idea, but it can go horribly wrong. I in fact have seen a popular website which is there which claims that the moon's phases act like this. The crescent half moon is correct. However, with our teeth, maybe we could only make a fat crescent. This is not the case. I think the educators would have been more careful if they had actually looked at the moon before doing the activity with their students. I am also familiar of instances where great artists like Van Gogh in the old times to Neil Gaiman in the modern times have made errors in depicting the phase of the moon. Again, you can see this fat crescent here in this very famous painting by Van Gogh, which also deliberately happens to be a part of my background in some of the frames. We might allow them some artistic liberty, but if you are a budding artist or if you want to truly represent the moon, there's an easy way to remember this. This is a nice design I found on the internet and the person has actually tried to understand how the moon's phases change in this to give this true representation. The simplest way to understand how the moon's phase changes is to draw a line down the center of the moon. This of course tells us how the first and the third quarter moon will be. They will be half. The dark part of the crescent on that day would be along this line. It will never leave this line or go beyond this point. The gibbous would also grow along this particular line. The terminator curve would grow towards the edge of the moon only along this diametrical line. So that's as easy as it is to draw correct phases of the moon. We can also look at this on an actual image of the moon. We are now at the waxing which is the growing and the gibbous which is the bulging phase. Compare this to yesterday when we had drawn the lunar terminator line which also happened to coincide almost with the zero longitude for the moon. It will keep growing in this direction without losing its contact with the poles. The crescent has also been growing very similarly. The terminator's edge has never lost contact with the poles. Let me also tell you an interesting fact that although at the poles the terminator moves away very slowly, at the equator of the moon the shadow here can travel over the surface of the moon at about 16 kilometers per hour. So now let's see things which are closer to the terminator for the day 10. We have another one of these spectacular clicks. On this one you may see a few defects. So let's ignore those because they come from taking various shots of the moon across the face and then trying to stitch them together. Sometimes we miss out an area like this or sometimes there's a mismatch of the lighting conditions. Moon photography can be quite a challenge. In this image, towards the north, you'll remember the Mare Frigoris, the Mare Serenatitis and Mare Vepora. You've also come to know of the Mare Imbrium, the Sea of Rains, which is more in the view today. Its beautiful circular edges are quite clear here. The new attraction in this is the crater Plato and the area around it. You may recognize Archimedes from day 9, but we have another giant name in astronomy coming into view here with the crater Copernicus. The person who for the first time gave us a complete heliocentric theory of the solar system. It was a long time before we accepted that the earth goes around the sun. However, he is immortalized on the moon with his name going to this beautiful deep crater that you can see. I think we should zoom into this area because it looks very beautiful and enticing to me. When we see it further up close, in the north, 
at the edge of the sea of rains, we see several mountain ranges. Leading up to Plato, right from the south are the mountain ranges, Apennines, Caucasus and the Alps. You'll also see a deep valley here, which is called the Vallis Alpis. This is actually a valley between the mountains and it would be great to know details of its origin. Other than these, you can see all these mountains are beautifully lit up with their shadows becoming very visible. The craters themselves have their shadows and the contrast gives a really good feel of the depth of these craters. There are activities which people could do in which they could use shadows of mountains, for example, this one, and actually try to find out using trigonometry what is the height of those mountains. Yes, it is possible and it was not just done now in modern times, it had even been tried by Galileo. So you can see there are newer and newer challenges that come across as we go and look at the moon in depth. If we look at the south, we have this beautiful but crater riddled lower half of the image. Here the dominating and the brightest part of the image happens to be our old friend Stevinus. Remember, I told you that things would change drastically as the angle of the light falling on various features on the moon changes. You can see this area has really changed. Stevinus is showing us that it is a relatively young crater in which the material which was thrown out during the impact has actually landed around the crater and is being lit up a bit more compared to the darker, older, dusty material of the regular moon surface. On the west side, we have the Mare Numbium, the sea of clouds, which, of which more is becoming visible today. We also have Tycho. Now this is another object which I have told you to look out for and the hint is that it is going to become a Stevinus but of a much larger scale. The crater Tycho is named after Tycho Brahe. The importance of this crater will become visible over the time as it becomes more and more lit. However, I'll tell you it is so important that a mission was actually sent here to soft land and take observations of the soil, etc. This was the landing site of the last of the surveyor missions. Now we have several successful mission series which have managed to land something or the other on the moon. But in the last century, we had only three successful missions, the Luna, the Apollo and the surveyor. And this one happens to be the last site of the surveyor missions. We'll return to look at this area better in the coming days. For the south of Tycho, you will notice the large and plain Clavius crater. It is huge and maybe such craters could form moon bases in the future. This one happens to be not so much at the south pole so as to not get any light at all, but also close to the south pole so that if there happens to be any ice in the craters around here, we would be able to access it. So space scientists would be looking at this as one of the favorable landing and colonizing sites on the moon. In these times, we don't even remember how the phases of the moon look like, but I'm sure there will come a time when all this knowledge would be very important and people would probably travel to Clavius or even further south to craters like the crater Newton. Very obviously, this crater is named after the famous physicist and mathematician Isaac Newton. In fact, it is very close to the South Pole. Just a few more crater hops and you'd be there at the pole of the moon. Interestingly and coincidentally, do you know that Newton had done a lot of his important work during a quarantine period? In his times, there was a large plague which affected Britain and people were told to stay in their homes for their safety. Of course, this was a great chance for him to get away from distractions and he could then think about his theory of gravitation. Of course, you notice that we are remembering him and his work during another quarantine period 
when the world is fighting the coronavirus. We will continue to bring you more such tidbits on the moon and about astronomy. So do share with us what you are doing in the moon challenge and be with us throughout the period. I'll see you in the next episode.